CBS News, I'm Bill Whitney at the Kennedy Space Center. Having delivered their cargo, the space shuttle astronauts have settled down for three days of system checks and experiments in orbit. Late yesterday, they deployed the Tedris communications satellite. Its first stage rocket pushed it away from discovery. And as the crew slept, NASA spokesman George Diller says Tedris moved into final position. The burn of the second stage came overnight, and uh, that burn was right on the money. The, the orbit is uh, essentially perfect. Uh, since then, the satellite has deployed its solar arrays and its antennas, and uh, it's doing very well. So essentially, we have a healthy satellite and a good orbit. One annoying problem for the five astronauts Stiller says their primary cooling system has to run warmer than usual to help melt the ice that's clogging the vents of a secondary system used during launch and re-entry. It's a little toasty in, in the, uh, on the flight deck. Uh, yesterday it, it got up as high as 88 degrees. Now this morning it's down to 79. Uh, they've turned off some non-essential systems on the flight deck which has allowed that temperature to drop. And uh, meantime they've become somewhat more comfortable by getting into their shorts. Today, Commander Rick Hauk and his crew will try to photograph lightning in the Earth's atmosphere. They'll test the effect of weightlessness on red blood cells, and they'll start a small furnace used to process materials in zero gravity. Atlanta. The crew's been awake now for about an hour and a half this morning. It's been a warm awakening, both from the Robin Williams musical presentation to the temperatures inside the shuttle cabin. It's about 87 degrees inside the Discovery. The temperature was elevated yesterday in hopes of helping the thaw of an apparent ice buildup in something called the flash evaporator, which helps cool the shuttle during the high heats of re-entry. Meanwhile, there's good news about the satellite that was deployed yesterday. It's now some 22,000 miles above the Atlantic Ocean, east of Brazil, in position. There's not that much on the agenda for the astronauts today, other than to begin some of the experiments aboard. But the biggest experiment, getting the shuttle back into space, has already been accomplished. The astronauts are now on the 19th hour of their four-day mission. Live at the Johnson Space Center, Steve McVicker, KTRH News Radio, 740 AM. First of all, JP, uh, this is not a new problem. It's happened before, and they, they're taking the steps that they took before, which uh, worked, and, uh, and it did thaw. If this doesn't thaw, this is part of a redundant system. There is another, uh, there's a backup uh, flash evaporator, which will be used, obviously. And there's uh, another cooling system aboard the shuttle, which also helps cool during re-entry. So uh, they don't think it's that big a problem. And Steve, where is this flash evaporator, and how do they thaw it? How are they going to repair this? It's uh, around the the, uh, the payload area, I believe. And uh, what they hope to do is just raise the cabin temperature um, enough to um, to to melt it, and then they would flush the uh, water, and uh, that would take care of it. Okay, thanks very much. That's News Radio Steve McVicker at Johnson Space Center. NASA officials plan to check out how well the redesigned booster rockets perform. Boosters were recovered from the Atlantic and on their, on their way to Cape Canaveral. They'll be broken into segments so engineers can examine the joints. It was the failure of the booster joints that destroyed the Challenger two and a half years ago. Major work done, Discovery crew orbits into day two. Mikhail Gorbachev begins showdown with opponents of domestic reform. Vatican issues major documents saying a woman's place is in the home, not on the altar. Good morning, Bill Lynch with the CBS World News Roundup. For the shuttle Discovery crew, yesterday's butterflies were replaced this morning by belly laughs. Good morning! So far, the nation's first manned space mission in 32 months is going by the book, as correspondent Bill Whitney reports. So, high up on the atmosphere. With NASA making its manned space comeback, this morning's musical wake-up call seemed to have special enthusiasm. Hey, look out the window! And Robin Williams' raucous good morning was answered in kind by Discovery. Good morning, here's Tom. Good morning, Discovery. We have you loud and clear. The crew learned this morning that the Tedris communications satellite popped out of the shuttle's cargo bay yesterday was successfully rocketed into its high stationary orbit during the night. NASA says Tedris is right on the money. Today, spokesman George Dillard says the astronauts will be busy checking out the shuttle systems and conducting scientific experiments, some of which could lead to new weapons against disease here on Earth. There is an AIDS enzyme that's being carried on board 
there is a blood experiment being carried on board that we think uh, will lead to some cures of uh, blood diseases and, and kidney diseases. We're trying to develop new pharmaceuticals to take advantage of a weightless environment. Discovery's environment is a bit less than perfect this morning. The crew has had to run the cabin cooling system warmer than usual to help melt ice that's clogging the vents of another cooler. The temperature hit 88 degrees at one point, so the astronauts put on their shorts. Bill Whitney, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. Two minutes now past the hour. Andrei Gromyko, a Soviet shakeup casualty. Reagan reported negotiating with Iran again. With Mutual News, I'm Bob Whitten in Washington. For the shuttle at this hour, although it's hotter than usual, one cooling device has iced up. NASA at the moment is quite interested in the performance of the reusable boosters. From the Kennedy Space Center, Mutual's Jim Bohannon. The spent shells of the redesigned reusable solid rocket boosters are returning to Cape Canaveral this morning. So far we know that the boosters didn't destroy the shuttle this time, but those metal casings will get the fine-tooth comb treatment to see if there is any damage around the O-rings. The boosters are due back at the Kennedy Space Center in about an hour and a half. They're being towed by boat. It was the O-rings you recall that were found at fault for the explosion. A communication satellite, and it will work in combination with another satellite just like it already in orbit. The two of them together will allow a communication between a single Earth station and uh, satellites or space shuttles flying around in space uh, about 90% uh, of the time. Right now, the, uh, NASA relies on a series of ground stations spread around the world. Uh, some are in remote locations, and they're all expensive to maintain. Um, and they only provide coverage about 15% of the time, or sometimes only 15% of the time. So this will uh, this will be cheaper in the long run, they say, and open up uh, some gaps in communication. Sounds like things are going pretty well. Aren't there any problems? Well, there, there's a problem that uh, that they're working on today, and will continue to work on probably through the rest of the day, which is that there is ice forming in uh, vents in uh, a shuttle cooling system. And uh, this is a problem because uh, during uh, re-entry, um, the uh, shuttle will heat up, and this cooling system needs to be working at, at maximum. Uh, and in fact, if this problem persists, it could mean an early end to this flight. But right now they're saying it's not uh, terribly serious. They're trying to defrost the ice by turning up the heat in the shuttle crew cabin. They're also going to point the, uh, the orbiter toward the sun. They hope that additional heat will help. And this is something that also happened on a previous shuttle flight, and all these things that they're trying today resolve the problem then, so that they don't think it'll be a, uh, a major problem. And again, this will be something they'll be working on all day today. What else is on tap for today? Uh, today they're going to be uh, returning to uh, some science experiments that they started yesterday, uh, including uh, uh, some experiments that could lead to the development of, uh, of new treatment for AIDS. Um, they'll be focusing on a, a, an experiment in which uh, they'll conduct cell separation in space, and, and that's actually the science experiment of the day. Um, uh, that hopefully will help in the development of a uh, new drug, or rather, uh, new methods for separating cells uh, back here on Earth. Howard, thank you very much. CBS News, I'm Mike Pulsifer. A federal discovery has started working on some of the experiments that are part of this first post-Challenger mission. They also took a look at damage in Mexico resulting from Hurricane Gilbert. As the shuttle blasted off yesterday, there was a bit of a scare for some of those watching. Flame appeared to be coming from the big booster rockets, eerily similar to that which was seen before the Challenger exploded. Bill Whitney at the Kennedy Space Center says space agency officials have offered an explanation. The flare-up was seen by people watching the launch, and it was seen on the TV pictures, and there seems to be a little extra flame near the end of the booster rocket. NASA says what it appears to be is a reverse flow of hot gases. They liken it to the effect of a motorcycle rider going down the highway and his shirt is pressed against his back because of a reverse pressure. They say that the boosters have been recovered and the initial word from the ships at sea is that the boosters seem to be in good shape. They're being brought back to the Cape today and they'll be analyzed by the manufacturer Morton Thiokol and it'll take several days of analysis before there's any firm word on the condition of the boosters. Everything is fine aboard the Challenger, with one minor exception. The astronauts are a little on the warm side, thanks to the failure of a cooling unit.
News. I'm John. Good morning, Discovery. And this afternoon, the shuttle crew answered with the Robin Williams tape with its own cassette of I Heard It Through the Grapevine. That's low fi from the high-tech shuttle. NASA says the astronauts will unveil a special memorial to the Challenger crew Sunday. This is the World Tonight. Good evening. I'm Doug Poling, CBS News, sitting in for Christopher Glenn. In Greece, in the Discovery Shuttle today, NASA had to turn on the heaters to try to thaw out a frozen heating system, one of several small, nagging problems, but none of them big enough to dampen the joy at having Discovery in orbit. While the astronauts were orbiting the Earth, the space shuttle's redesigned booster rockets recovered in the Atlantic were towed back to Cape Canaveral today. And Ed Medal of the Marshall Space Flight Center says a visual inspection reveals no sign of leaks from the O-ring seals. They both look uh, very good. Uh, it'll take about a day for us to get the, uh, the boosters out of the water. And then we'll go ahead and, and start processing the boosters. And... Uh, the proof of the pudding is when we go ahead and uh, take the joints apart. Aboard Discovery, it was a day for conducting experiments in the weightless environment. The crew started several science projects, but the schedule has not been demanding. At an afternoon briefing, NASA's Milt Heflin was asked about that. That's perhaps a fair observation, but that's, uh, that's my intent is to, is, to, is to try to build this flight, you know, take that first step, get the lid off the bucket and uh, go from there. One technical problem cropped up. The shuttle's dish antenna used to transmit data back to Earth failed to return to its stowed position. The engineers are working on several ways to get it locked down. Bill Whitney, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center. News. I'm Jim Shenevy. The space shuttle astronauts are enjoying their last few hours of sleep this morning. Soon it will be up and at them for another busy day of experiments and even a re-entry rehearsal. Yesterday was a good day for Discovery, despite some glitches with the air conditioning and a TV antenna that wouldn't stow properly. After the TV antenna had been deployed, it didn't track uh, automatically. Uh, so we uh, turned it off and looked at the data that we uh, had received while the KU band antenna had been op being operated and decided that uh, the most intelligent thing to do was to restore it, uh, and that's what we did. Flight Director Chuck Shaw. The U.S. team has added some more gold to the tally at the Seoul Olympics. The U.S. men's 1,600-meter relay team came out on top with a time of 2 minutes, 56.16 seconds. That tied a 20-year-old world record. The U.S. women's 1,600-meter team came in second to the Soviets, but they had just finished running to a gold medal in the 400-meter relay. The Soviet shakeup continues. Mikhail Gorbachev assumes the presidency. The astronauts aboard Space Shuttle Discovery are carrying out more experiments. The Pakistani army moves to end ethnic violence. Good morning, I'm Mike Pulsifer, and this is the CBS World News Roundup. Space agency people on the ground try to come up with different and interesting ways to wake up the astronauts during shuttle flights. Yesterday, comedian Robin Williams did the honors. Today, it was a musical wake up. A Houston band's customized version of an old Beach Boys song. It prompted astronaut Pinky Nelson to radio back, Don't Stop, Great Tune. On the more serious side, all is going well on this first shuttle mission since the Challenger disaster. The astronauts are carrying out a variety of experiments and taking photographs. Today's schedule also includes a rehearsal for Monday's return to Earth. A good day. CBS News, I'm David Jackson. Democrat space shuttlers have a light schedule today as they get set to come home on Monday. There were some experiments to do, and CBS News correspondent David Dow at the Space Center in Houston followed along. It involved the testing of uh, filament wires of uh, a titanium alloy. It was designed to see whether applying uh, intense heat would change their composition in a way that would make them a uh, stronger, lighter alloy. Uh, this would, of course, have applications in the aerospace and the aviation industry here, which draws heavily on titanium alloys. The Discovery Five are also rehearsing an emergency bailout plan for use if needed on reentry.
CBS News, this is Mitchell Krause. A mo- Discovery astronauts who passed the halfway mark in their scheduled flight. The crew performed a variety of scientific experiments today. They land Monday in California. At three minutes after the hour, this is CBS News. CBS News, I'm Bill Vitka. For Discovery, it's the wake-up call for the last full day in space. Are you awake yet? Why? Because it's time to eat breakfast from a toothpaste tube. The wake-up call is one part Mickey Mouse Club and one part astronaut Pinky Nelson's alma mater, Harvey Mudd College. What lies ahead today for the shuttle is a news conference later. The astronauts also plan at that time a memorial for the Challenger crew who perished during liftoff in January 1986. Like yesterday, there will be more scientific research. The astronauts will also begin to tie up loose ends and get ready for tomorrow's return to Earth. CBS News, I'm Rob Armstrong. The crew of the Space Shuttle Discovery is busy today with scientific experiments and a dress rehearsal for tomorrow's return to Earth. In a little less than an hour, the Discovery crew will pay tribute to the seven astronauts who died in the Challenger disaster. After that, they will answer questions relayed from reporters on Earth. Yet even before the Discovery is back, there are questions about the cost of continuing the manned space program. We can't afford to give up leadership in manned space, which is the the most visible part of the space program. James Fletcher, the administrator of NASA, appeared today on the CBS News broadcast, Face the Nation. The whole world watches when we are successful, and the whole world watches when we have a failure. And uh, how can we leave the rest of the world if we give up something like manned space? It's a small part of the federal budget, about 1% or perhaps less. And I think as long as it stays in there, uh, nobody's, nobody's going to notice the, uh, uh, the expenditures on space. They certainly would notice it if we gave up uh, the manned space program. Fletcher also says he believes the Soviets wanted to upstage the U.S. by launching their own space shuttle before the launch of Discovery. But he said problems on a recent manned Soviet space flight may have given them second thoughts. George Bush will be on hand tomorrow when the shuttle touches down at California's Edwards Air Force Base. Today, only Lloyd Benson has any campaign activities scheduled. No privileges to view over the past several days. As we watch along with you, many emotions swell up in our hearts. Joy for America's return to space. Gratitude for our nation's support through difficult times. Thanksgiving for the safety of our crew. Reverence for those who sacrificed and made our journey possible. Gazing outside, we can understand why mankind has looked towards the heavens with awe and wonder since the dawn of human existence. We can comprehend why our countrymen have been driven to explore the vast expanse of space. And we are convinced that this is the road to the future. The road that Americans must travel if we are to maintain the dream of our Constitution, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. As we, the crew of Discovery, witness this earthly splendor from America's spacecraft, less than 200 miles separates us from the remainder of mankind. In a fraction of a second, our words reach your ears. But lest we ever forget that these few miles represent a great gulf, that to ascend to this seemingly tranquil sea will always be brought with danger, let us remember the Challenger crew, whose voyage was so tragically short. With them, we shared a common purpose. With them, we shared a common goal. At this moment, our place in the heavens makes us feel closer to them than ever before. Those on the Challenger who had flown before and seen these sights they would know the meaning of our thoughts. Those who had gone to view them for the first time, they would know why we set forth. They were our fellow sojourners. They were our friends. Today, our 
here where the blue sky turns to black, we can say at long last to Dick, Mike, Judy, to Ron and Al, and to Krista and Greg. Dear friends, we have resumed the journey that we promised to continue for you. Dear friends, your loss has meant that we could confidently begin anew. Dear friends, your spirit and your dream are still alive in our hearts. A tribute to the Challenger crew from the crew of STS-26 Discovery. We're looking at a view of Earth. And Houston, uh, Discovery, back over to you. Uh, Discovery, on behalf of the Challenger families and all of us down here, it sure does feel good to see the Challenger mission continue in America back in space. And now, Discovery, uh, we have a good downlink from the mid, uh, mid deck. Uh, if you're ready to uh, start the uh, press conference, we'll start with a voice check and then continue. Roger, we're ready. JSC PAO, this is Houston. Please go ahead with your call. Discovery, this is JSC PAO. We're ready to proceed with this news conference, uh, if you are. Uh, we're ready. Okay, the first question is from uh, Laura Tolley of the Associated Press. Commander Haug, you said before the flight that you expected there would be some surprises. Can you tell us what surprises you've seen on this flight? Well, I guess the first surprise is right at liftoff we had a caution and warning tone, actually an alert tone, which got our attention real quick and uh, gave us a few mo moments to uh, concern ourselves about it. We also had uh, a problem with one of our flash evaporators. Those are technical problems. I guess uh, I was very pleased, but I wasn't surprised at how much I enjoyed it up here, though. We really enjoyed being up here in this tremendous machine and seeing the beautiful sights we see. Lynn Shearer, ABC. Gentlemen, you are all veterans of space flight. You've all been there before, but it's been more than two and a half years for all of you. Is there any difference in being back in space? What have you observed? Does it feel different? Does it feel the same? I was just going to uh, say that I think it's surprising how little has changed. Uh, I think all of us we adapted to space very quickly, and the communications with mission control seemed like uh, really had been two and a half years. I think everyone was was uh, adapted all their jobs that we had to do, and uh, I think we got business back in business uh, very well. Tony Clark, CNN. Gentlemen, your wives said the other day that watching the launch, they were filled with excitement but also fear that it was wonderful and awful at the same time. I'm interested in your feelings as you took off. Well, I think I can speak for the crew and say that uh, it was really wonderful when we lifted off. Uh, it certainly was uh, a lot more... Uh, uh, anxiety producing than we had anticipated, or at least I had, uh, throughout the, the entire ascent. Uh, I had forgotten what it was like to accelerate at 3G for a sustained period of time, and uh, how helpless you really feel during that time period. Bruce, the Hall, Hall CBS, CBS News. For Dave Hilmers, you've flown before, but after this flight is over, what special moment do you want to tell your family about? Well, I think there are going to be an awful lot of moments that I'm going to tell my family about. So many things that uh, we've shared up here. Uh, I think some of the Earth views that we've seen and some of the, uh, the nighttime scenes of the stars, those are just so indescribable. I, I wish that I could take the view that I actually see rather than just pictures back to them, but I'll try my best to describe them. Sure, 
Chinese flying and sign CPI. Uh, you guys didn't appear very busy up there at times. Was your flight plan too conservative, and would your time have been better spent with a busier flight plan? Well, I think we've stayed pretty busy uh, here on the mid-deck. We've done uh, 12 different uh, scientific experiments of uh, one sort or another, and uh, the days have seemed very full. Uh, in the future, we hope we get back into the business of uh, putting on spacesuits and building space stations and uh, uh, repairing satellites, uh, but there's a lot of good science that you can do right here in this uh, facility you see us in right now. Uh, Discovery, this is Craig Cavalt with Aviation Week. To follow on your opening and Dave's uh, comments there a moment ago, can you tell us specifically about some of the more spectacular sites you've seen around the world? And let's go to Pinky. Well, I guess I'll divide it into three different parts. In the daytime, we've had some spectacular uh, passes across the Africa. Discovery Houston, uh, would you hold that for 30 seconds while we hand over to you? Pick that up again when we get back. Great shots of the ground. At night, uh, there's indescribable views coming over uh, South America, huge fires in the forests and uh, big cities down there. And, uh, and the sky at night is a, a completely different view. We spent some time just looking with our eyes and some time uh, looking with our uh, low light level camera that have given us some views. Uh, I always enjoy seeing the Southern Hemisphere and have been dragging people to the window showing them the Magellanic Clouds and the Southern Cross. DC. And I have a question for Rick and Dick. Can you give us some idea of your uh, flight plan for tomorrow, your landing patterns, and what landmarks you'll be looking for as you come in? Well, we'll be coming in uh, just about between Los Angeles and Santa Barbara, overhead the coast, about 110,000 feet, and uh, circling around, we hope, if the uh, weather permits and the winds permit, to land on Edwards uh, Runway 17. Uh, we'll pass overhead the field at about 40,000 feet, becoming subsonic. You all can hear us uh, as we're supersonic, a double sonic boom. When you hear that, you'll know we're about five minutes from landing. And then we'll make our standard approach, 300 miles an hour, coming down to a, a touchdown about 200 miles an hour on that lake bed. James Fisher with the Orlando Sentinel. This is for Mike Lowndes. There are two men now running for president. What would you say from, to, to them from uh, the shuttle to convince them to fully support the space program and its long-term future, even if it means uh, putting up budget increases for NASA in a time of considerable deficits? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I think we have to take the long view. Uh, this is a very important flight simply because it's the first step. And uh, I would hope that all the enthusiasm that we've seen throughout the country for this flight is sustained for the, the dozens and dozens of flights we have ahead of us if we're going to make this program grow to the point that it needs to grow to get us on the path to the future. John Getter, KHOU TV, Discovery Gentlemen. Um the Challenger crew set out to teach some very important lessons they felt to the children of the world. I'd like to know what you would hope lessons would be taken from your flight and the effort it took to get to where you are today. Well, John, uh, I've got uh, a couple of uh, young daughters and uh, I know that uh, what I would want them to learn from what I've done is that there's always uh, a reward for hard work both uh, individually and as a group, uh, much like the effort that was put forth by NASA and our contractors to get the space shuttle flying again. And that uh, there are new adventures everywhere. Space is one of them. And that hopefully uh, all, the, all the young children out there uh, that want to come to space someday will at least have the opportunity to try.
his last night in space, Discovery Commander Rick Houck has said good night to Mission Control. We're sure looking forward to getting a chance to see everybody in person and swap stories and give our thanks to you tomorrow. Okay, and the final talk for the night uh, is don't worry, be happy. Tomorrow, the shuttle crew comes home, capping the first mission since the Challenger disaster nearly three years ago. It's been smooth sailing so far for the Discovery 5. After four days and nearly two million miles, the crew will touch down at Edwards Air Force Base in California. CBS News correspondent Christopher Glenn explains why. Almost all of the 24 shuttle landings so far have been at Edwards for a simple reason. It's big. The runway that's graded out of the Rogers Dry Lake bed is a seven and a half miles long. That's two and a half times the length of the only other runway the shuttles have ever landed on, three miles of concrete at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Also, the Florida runway is only 300 feet wide with swampy ground on either side. Here, the lake bed is rock hard, perfectly flat, and miles wide so that if the landing spacecraft should somehow get off the designated runway area, the consequences would be much less severe. Earlier today, the crew held a Space to Earth news conference and paid tribute to the Challenger 7, one astronaut saying, it's good to be back where they wanted to go so badly. It's 12 midnight at KLBJ AM. At this time, we'll be signing off shortly to make meter adjustments. Four miles up at 17,000 miles an hour will appear as a fast-moving point of bright light similar to a star moving along a steady path. In the Houston area, the shuttle will be visible for about four minutes beginning at 641 this morning, 16 degrees above the horizon and traveling from the south-southwest to the east-southeast. NASA is looking to the future as a follow-up to the successful shuttle discovery flight. Topping the list of upcoming space events is the launch of the shuttle Atlantis around November 17th. It will ferry a secret military spy satellite into orbit, and the exact launch time is classified. Seven shuttle flights are scheduled for 1989, with 10 on tap in 1990, 9 in 1991, 13 in 1992, and 9 through September of 1993. Of the 50 flights on the books, 10 are classified military missions. CBS News, I'm Bill Whitney. California, here they come. The space shuttle astronauts are due to land at Edwards Air Force Base today. Correspondent Christopher Glenn is there. A day for waving the flag on the Rogers Dry Lake bed, and perhaps 150,000 people will be doing just that as they scream a welcome home to the Discovery crew. One eager spectator said he was inspired to brave the traffic leading to the public viewing area by what he felt at launch time four days ago. I was so excited when I lifted off. I, I was crossing my fingers and my toes, and, and I was so happy that uh, it went off well, and I'm sure we're on the right track now. Indeed. This comeback flight has been about as trouble-free as any in the past. Still, landing the powerless space shuttle is no piece of cake. From the moment the deorbit burn begins over the Indian Ocean until the wheels hit the runway and Discovery rolls to a stop, Mission Control and the crew will be all business. And then, let the cheering start. Christopher Glenn, CBS News at Edwards Air Force Base. On hand to greet Discovery will be Vice President George Bush. His Democratic rival, Michael Dukakis, has campaign stops scheduled today at an elementary school in Hartford, Connecticut, and he'll watch confiscated drugs being burned in Dearborn Heights, Michigan. For this morning's return of the Space Shuttle Discovery, New Radio Steve McNecker has the latest from the Johnson Space Center. At a little past 10.30 this morning, Houston time, the Discovery's thruster engines will be fired for what is known as the deorbit burn. That will take place over the Indian Ocean and will begin the ship's descent back into the Earth's atmosphere, headed towards a landing at Edwards Air Force Base at about 11.37 Houston time. In about 30 minutes from now, the Discovery may be visible here in Houston in the south-southwestern sky. That will be about 6.38 at an angle of 17 degrees from the horizon. The sighting should last about eight minutes until the shuttle disappears in the south-southeastern sky. The forecasters say the weather continues to look good at Edwards, as well as the backup landing sites at White Sands and the Cape. Live from the Johnson Space Center, Steve McVicker, KTRH News Radio, 7:40 a.m. Steve, yes, there is. At 7:30 tonight, uh, they're uh, expected to arrive back at Ellington Field. 
I believe the gates are opening early over there to accommodate everyone so they can get in. But, uh, yes, there's quite a celebration plan for Ellington tonight. Mm, at probably see a big crowd. Okay, thanks very much. That's uh, News Radio Steve McVicker at uh, Johnson Space Center. KT it's homecoming day for shuttle discovery. George Bush, ahead by seven points in a new poll, will welcome the astronauts. Supreme Court set to tackle random drug testing, the death penalty, and other issues. Good morning, Bill Lynch with the CBS World News Roundup. If all continues to go well, shuttle discovery should be back on solid ground in about four and a half hours. Correspondent Bruce Hall reports from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. It is a busy morning for the Discovery astronauts as they prepare to return to Earth. The five were awakened early this morning with a special rendition of the Beach Boys' Fun, Fun, Fun. Commander Rick Houck says the shuttle has worked superbly, saying I am not sure we have ever had a mission this trouble-free before. But all of the activities on this trip were overshadowed by the basic fact that this flight signified the resumption of America's manned space flight program after a two-and-a-half-year hiatus following the Challenger accident. For a report on the landing at Edwards Air Force Base, here is CBS News correspondent Christopher Glenn. Landing day is always a gala occasion on the Rogers Dry Lake bed, but it's never been like this. Estimates are perhaps 200,000 people will have snaked their way up the two-lane desert road leading to the public viewing site by touchdown time. An ocean of trailers, campers, RVs, and ecstatic, patriotic people. The flags are all up and people are all getting ready to see that moment. That's what brought me here. I wanted to be a part of it. I've always wanted to come out, and after what happened before, I thought maybe I'd never get to again. It's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Vice President Bush will be here, too, greeting the astronauts as they emerge from the orbiter 45 minutes after landing, and then leading the traditional welcome-home ceremonies a couple of hours later. His aides insist it's an official and not a campaign visit. Christopher Glenn, CBS News at Edwards Air Force Base. Two minutes past the hour. Space Shuttle Discovery's big cargo bay doors are being closed right now. Soon the five astronauts will be suiting up, preparing to glide to a touchdown on the dry lake bed in the California desert. Correspondent Christopher Glenn says it will be a shakedown of the shuttle's redesigned landing gear. After the uh, Challenger disaster, of course, uh, hundreds of modifications were made to the orbiter and the spacecraft systems, uh, some of which involved this landing procedure that we'll see here this morning. For one thing, they beefed up the brakes on the uh, space shuttle. They beefed up the landing gear, too, noting that 15 of the 24 previous shuttle landings have been uh, marred by brake damage uh, after the uh, spaceship touched down. Discovery uh, has been equipped with the, uh, with the new brakes, the new landing gear, and NASA officials expect that they're going to work properly. Assuming a successful shuttle landing, Vice President Bush will be positioned for a golden photo opportunity when he greets the astronauts. Supreme Court opens to many questions. Shuttle about two and a half hours out now. With Mutual News, I'm Bob Whitten in Washington. The high level. It's touchdown day for the shuttle team, and they're going through the space equivalent of putting their tray tables and seat backs in the upright position for landing. A regular latch, uh, micro switches, we only had two of three. Everything else was nominal, and uh, the trajectory looks uh, real nominal as well. That's some good eyes there, Dave. We copy and concur. The shuttle bay doors closed properly. The shuttle will start to drop out of orbit in about an hour and a half with landing at Edwards Air Force Base at 12.37 Eastern Time this afternoon where upwards of 200,000 people are waiting. It's my first time to come up here, so I'm just excited to be here to see it. This is my second time out here for a landing, though, so I'm excited about it, especially after, you know, Columbia. This is the first time I've had the opportunity to come out and, and see it and kind of enthused about the whole thing. It's about time we get back in space. Just want to see what happens. Hear the landing live on many of these mutual stations. The Good Monday morning, everybody. I'm Chet Douglas with the latest from ABC News. Only an hour and a half from landing in Southern California, and the crew of the Space Shuttle Discovery appears to be as anxious as the estimated quarter million people on the ground waiting for them. A little while ago, this from the shuttle. We're all fitted up, ready to come home. 
Astronaut Paul White, deputy director of the Johnson Space Center in Houston, is among those waiting. He says the rebuilt shuttle appears to be a real winner. We learned that it functions beautifully. I, I really can't believe it, and I think most of the folks who are involved with the program can't. It's, uh, it has exceeded our wildest expectations. ABC's Vic Ratner will be watching the blue California sky for the first glimpse of that big black and white bird and says, you and I would think it's a pretty wild ride. Landing would scare the you-know-what off most airline passengers. The shuttle really flies like a brick. It comes down very steeply, seven times as steep a dive as a jetliner. And with no engines on board, you only get one try at getting it right. As I said, there's something like a quarter of a million of the people there to watch the shuttle land, among them a whole busload of kids who came down from Hesperia, California, to see history being made. Little Sylvia Ramos was asked why she's there. It's something that the United States made, and are the successful most of the time. Well, this seems to be one of those times that things are going right, Sylvia. The landing, just 90 minutes from right now. I'll have more for you after this.
They did have a successful burn. They're heading for Edwards Air Force Base in California now. Landing should be in another 51 minutes. Discovery now within range of the Yargany tracking station on the west coast of Australia. On this is 64th orbit. The orbiter will be landing on runway 17 at Edwards. And while we wait for more communication, we're going to learn a little more about the head-up display system. To take that the flight crew look down for information and then ask for the out-the-window information. During critical flight phases, in particular the approach and landing sequence, this is not an easy task. In the orbiter, with its unique vehicle dynamics and approach trajectories, this situation is even more critical. Many military aircraft and some regular... Dan Houston, I imagine you saw the mummy correct when I said it was not an ignition, it was uh, well into the burn that we got the alarm. Roger, we copy, Rick. Again, air miners already use the head-up display. A head-up display is used to assist in landing. It allows an out-the-window view while providing flight commands and information to the flight crew by superimposing this information on a transparent combiner on the window field of view. It is an electronic optical device with two sets of combiner glasses located above the glare shield and in direct line of sight of the commander and pilot. Essential flight information for vehicle guidance and control during approach and landing is projected on the combiner glass. The system requirements for the orbiter were patterned on existing hardware in order to minimize development costs. While the display portion of the orbiter system could be similar to existing HUD systems, the drive electronics could not. The orbiter avionics are digital, and since minimal impact to the orbiter was paramount, the HUD drive electronics are designed to receive data from the orbiter databases. Most existing HUD drive electronics use analog data or a combination of analog-digital interface. In the orbiter system, the HUD drive electronics utilize to the maximum extent possible the same data which drives the existing electromechanical display devices to minimize impact on the orbiter software. The display device uses a cathode ray tube to create the image which is then projected through a series of lenses onto a combining glass. has just 36 minutes left. Roger, not clear. We're all suited up, ready to come home. This is Christopher Glenn at Edwards Air Force Base in California. They're headed home. About 25 minutes ago, the crew fired up Discovery's maneuvering engines, slowing the spacecraft's speed by more than 200 miles an hour, sending it hurtling down toward the top of the atmosphere. When the burn was over, nearly three minutes later, the crew radioed welcome news. Discovery Houston with you at Yargi. Go ahead. Roger, the burn was good, uh, no residuals. In a few minutes, they enter that part of their earthward run when the friction of the air heats up the ship until it glows, causing a nail-biting 14-minute communications dropout. But given that good deorbit burn, they should emerge from it right on target, sailing toward touchdown about a half hour from now. Christopher Glenn, CBS News, at Edwards Air Force Base. Wellington, please remember to wear yellow. That's the request for this evening, and we'll give our crew a real greeting home. Waiting for more communication. Right now we have a different angle of the crowd. Weather looks beautiful. Discovery now still in its communications blackout. The 
the blackout lasts about 14 minutes, so we should be hearing from them shortly. Touchdown now, about 30 minutes away. The last word that we had from the crew was that everything was going well, although there was a mission control. Houston Discovery should be entering the uh, entry interface portion of the flight regime in just a couple of seconds. Meanwhile, the very latest uh, forecast for surface winds at Edwards uh, light and variable. According to the uh, lead forecaster for this flight, Steve Sokol, who uh, works for the Space Flight Meteorology Group here in Houston, uh, an arm of the National Weather Service, uh, assigned to the Mission Operations Directorate. Light and variable winds, weather, of course, no major factor to the landing. They'll be using the dry lake bed instead of the runway out there for safety. They want to make sure that they have a, a wide margin of error should any error occur. And it's unlikely that it will. We've heard that everything has been going well in their preparations today. Still watching on NASA Select uh, a view of the crowd. And then we should be hearing from the crew again in about uh, 14 minutes. Right now we see the caravan of vehicles that will rendezvous with the Discovery after it stops its landing roll. Now up over 400,000. 
this is all looking good with Discovery's uh, descent into California. Uh, from all indications we've had on the uh, brief bursts of telemetry we've had through a couple of different sites over the Pacific, uh, Discovery is still in communication blackout, uh, but we expect she will uh, leave that condition within about a minute or so. a bit of crackle as we wait on signal from the crew. We're now receiving C-band telemetry. We'll be up on voice momentarily and pictures, I would think, very soon. The orbiter should come up within view of the Vandenberg camera. Still looking at the crew as they wait their first view of discovery. Touchdown just 13 minutes away. Touchdown is 13 minutes away, and we're now processing telemetry through the Western Test Range Station. We show Discovery's altitude at 17,999 feet, her velocity 12,656 feet per second. She's descending at a rate. Discovery Houston with you at Vandenberg. Uh, nice to hear your voice, loud and clear. Same to you, loud and clear, Rick. The landing of Shuttle Discovery, a special report. I'm Bill Grudy along with Bruce Hagen at Edwards Air Force Base in California. The Shuttle Discovery is expected to touch down Discovery on a dry lake bed here in the California desert in about 12 minutes. An hour ago, 200 miles up over the east coast of Africa, the astronauts fired their rockets, taking the shuttle out of orbit, putting it on a path to touch down here half a world away. Propulsion systems officer reports were burning and looking good. Eleven tenths minutes later, the word came crackling back that everything was going fine. Before we continue with our shuttle story, we still have 11 minutes and 31 seconds until the shuttle touches down. We have another breaking story we need to tell you about. The United States has been told that an American hostage in Lebanon will be freed. But there are very few details. What we know from correspondent Steve Porter. Spokesman Marlon Fitzwater says the White House has received reports that a hostage will be released, but beyond that, he says there are no other details. No name, no date, no time, no location, and he says, we've received reports like this before, and there was no release. So the attitude here is wait and see, as the White House re-emphasizes that its policy on hostages has not changed, that there will be no deals made to gain their release. Fitzwater wouldn't say what authorities notified U.S. officials that the hostage would be released, though he did not rule out Syria, which has been reported as the source. Okay, Steve, we'll keep you up to date on that breaking story. Now let's get back to the shuttle story. Uh, Bruce Hagen is out on the dry lake bed, the huge expanse of sand where the shuttle will land. And Bruce, what's it like out there? It's getting hot. Uh, we had a bitterly cold night out here on the desert, and now the sun is out. It's been out for a few hours, and the temperature is moving up rapidly into the 90s. It is a beautiful day out here. High, wispy clouds uh, hanging over the mountains, and uh, miles and miles of visibility on uh, what is actually a clay bed here, the dry lake bed. Uh, 44 square miles of clay and uh, it will provide a perfect landing site for Discovery. They've painted a seven mile long runway on the clay, but if Discovery overshoots that, there's plenty of room to spare, and we're looking forward to a safe touchdown, Bill. Okay, we're 10 minutes away from the landing. That call from Capcom. I can see Edwards from here, Houston, it sure looks gorgeous. Sounds pretty good. And I'm sure it does, Rick. And here at Edwards, there are thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people oh, yeah, waiting to greet the astronauts. 380,000 spectators. That's the second largest crowd ever. Uh, we talked to some of them this morning. One is Chuck Frazier, and he's been out here a long time. We uh, headed out at midnight and uh, as, a, as a group of about nine of us, and we're excited about being here. More adrenaline flowing, keeping us awake. As Gary Schmidt waits, he looks to the future. I'm glad that it's, uh, you know, so far it's been a success, and I think this is the start of getting it all rolling again. Okay, we're crossing our fingers. Transfer to the BFS. At nine minutes and 14 seconds until uh, the landing. We see the trail uh, on a map that NASA has provided, a moving map. It's just approaching the California coast now. 170 miles, nautical miles from touchdown. They're at an altitude of about 12,000 feet, velocity 5,530 feet per second. 
and it's cruising at about 424 miles per hour. Pretty, uh, pretty swift. It's under the control, or will be in a few moments, under the Range control... To the runway 151 nautical miles. Under the control of a sophisticated guidance system. Uh, the astronauts will monitor it, but they really don't have control over it. Uh, the shuttle is on uh, something they call Autoland, as it uh, heads across the California coast and down into... Uh, Discovery Edward's converging Air. on uh, coast crossing out of velocity uh, 4,900 feet per second. Now, the shuttle is going to make a series of S maneuvers now, quick turns to uh, slow it down and to get it in position for the landing uh, on the dry lake bed. Uh, as uh, the pilot said, you only have one chance at this. It's not like a commercial airliner. You can't go around two or three times. You've got to make it on the first, uh, the first try, even though they have a lot of latitude. Even one small mistake in this final approach could put them in the ocean or could put them uh, overshooting uh, the runway or even someplace in New Mexico. So we're talking about a very critical period in the, uh, the shuttle's approach. It's now uh, the map, uh, the tracking map we have over the California coast, and we have seen by NASA's long lens the first picture of the shuttle descending, going down at about a 30 degree angle through the blue California sky. It's a very hazy picture, but uh, there it is, and it seems to be uh, descending very smoothly. In fact, the uh, the angle flattening out. 1,000 feet, velocity 3,700 feet per second, descending at a rate of 230 feet per second. As it comes down, and we see it bank, and it's making one of those S-turns I talked about a moment ago to slow it down and make sure that it's right on... Under 90 miles uh, from the runway now. Right on target. It should be about 300 miles an hour, traveling about 300 miles an hour. That's an amazing uh, deceleration when you consider that it was going uh, more than 17,000 miles an hour uh, when it dropped out of orbit uh, almost an hour ago. And so it descends... Uh, very slowly. It's a fuzzy picture fading in and out. This is a very long lens. It's, uh, it's picking it up just as it crosses the, uh, the California Discovery coast. Houston, take air data to GNC only. The data tracking system seem to be uh, working perfectly. Uh, that's what uh, Capcom is confirming to us, that it's a, it's a textbook landing so Discovery far. Discovery Houston, take air data to NAV. That there are no problems okay. developing. In a few Mr. moments... Control, those commands uh, increase the fidelity of the tracking aboard Discovery and uh, puts her more precisely on her energy and ground track and uh, heading into the Edwards area. She's now at an altitude of 84,000 feet, moving at a rate of 2,400 feet per second, descending at a rate of 274 feet per second. At 84,000 feet, that would be about... about 57 miles to the runway now. Twice the... Uh, the height of the uh, the average uh, jetliner flies, and we see the tracking uh, the tracking map shows it closing in on Edwards Air Force Base. There will be a couple of other short maneuvers and then a loop around the base uh, before the shuttle lands. You know, you have to remember this here on hand to greet the uh, the astronauts. He arrived about an hour ago, and uh, he's standing in a uh, in a the VIP viewing area near a grandstand that has a huge red and white sign that says "Welcome." Uh, Welcome home, Special Astro. Control Houston. We're now looking at uh, Discovery passing overhead from a camera at Dryden Flight Research Facility. Yeah, we're seeing a wide angle straight underneath Discovery as it uh, as it flies overhead. Pretty soon, uh, Bruce out on the lake bed. You should be able to pick that up with uh, with the naked eye. Although it is probably now about uh, fifty thousand feet up. Our energy status is uh, right on the money, which means Discovery is coming right down the exact. Uh, uh, entry and glide slope that uh, is pre-programmed and uh, preferred. Her velocity now 1,300 feet per second. She's at about 62,000 feet. Four minutes. Yeah, about 32 good. miles away from touchdown on runway 17 at Edwards Air Force Base. We're really expecting a... to see Discovery any minute now. Everybody's scanning the skies, hoping for the first glimpse of the spaceship as it comes down. Discovery should be passing through Mach 1 any minute, that is, uh, slowing down and passing through the speed of sound as they line up for their approach to this runway. Again, they're aiming for a seven-mile-long runway, a strip of uh, runway painted on the mud flats Discovery here. Discovery is play approaching flats. a point where she will intersect the heading alignment circle. She'll be making a left overhead turn. And there goes the turn. We can see it on a NASA camera. It's a ghost-like figure. Turn angle figure. is 249 degrees. They'll be shooting for the nominal lane point on the Edwards 17 runway. Four minutes. Four Here's minutes. That, uh, 
She will uh, touch down about 2,000 feet beyond the runway threshold. And it looks like it's coming straight down, although that's probably an optical illusion. The angle well, of the you know, Bill, appears to be They very, call this a glider, but they, they call this a glider. But they say it's more like a streamlined brick, and uh, it looks like Discovery is now visible to the naked eye, high, high up in the skies. You hear that sonic boom? Every one feet per second. Tremendous excitement and anticipation here. Intersecting the heading one in circle. Two sonic booms as Discovery passes overhead, now coming in for its final approach. Tremendous excitement here at uh, the dry lake bed. Discovery is still high, high up there, thousands and thousands of feet above the wispy white clouds. Of course, Discovery is now on the hat. And in line with circle, she's making her left overhead turn and looking good. Discovery is just hurtling down to earth, leaving a contrail behind it, coming down at a tremendous speed. Leaving a curved Discovery contrail above the cloud. Uh, vector transfer to the BFS. Do you get the sense of that steep angle out there seeing in person? It looks almost as if it's coming straight down, Bill. I know that it's coming towards us. But it is a very steep angle. It just seems to be plunging down out of the skies at a tremendous rate of speed. That's it. We're seeing NASA. Discovery at 23,000 feet. Her range to touch down about 9.5 nautical miles. She's moving at 663 feet per second. Crowds here out at the uh, landing site are very excited. Children pointing in the air. Way around her uh, left overhead turn. Now clearly visible. As she lines up for her approach to the uh, Edwards 17 runway on a desert like bed. Discovery now below the clouds. A white speck in the sky and the blue skies. Rapidly approaching a landing. Minute and 46 seconds. Officer reports. Discovery looking good. Rolling on to final. Discovery looking good as it comes in for its landing. Out about 14,000 feet, range 8.1 nautical miles. Still about 10 miles out, but uh, clearly visible, growing in size by the second, moving at uh, probably better than three, 400 miles an hour at this point. They'll be moving at 215 miles an hour when they touch down in a couple of minutes. And uh, they're following a circular path to line up with the runway. On center line, on glide slope. Winds are calm. Looks real pretty. Everything looking good. Discovery now still a few thousand feet up in the sky. 3,000 feet. Discovery will execute her pre-flare maneuver. That's a maneuver to help them slow down, the pre-flare maneuver. About 6,500 feet, descending, descending at a rate of 180 feet per second. That is dropping like a rock, 180 Speed, feet per second. 550 feet per second. Discovery looks to be heading straight for me here. It's a tremendous sight, coming down very rapidly. Uh, you can just make out the uh, the wings barely from where I am, about a mile and a half or two miles away. And uh, we're just seconds away from touchdown, and so far it looks like a beautiful, beautiful landing. They're now closing rapidly on the runway, just a few hundred feet up, coming down lower and lower. Gear are down. Landing gear is down. And they're just feet above the runway now. The gear down and locked, the report from Mission Control. There is touchdown, I believe touchdown. Landing gear touchdown. Your perfect and landing. Now rotating the nose down, standing by for nose gear and touchdown. Discovery speeding across the dry lake bed, leaving a plume of dust in its wake. Coming to a to a quick stop here, hitting the ground at about 215 miles an hour, and uh, still moving down the runway. It uh, couldn't have gone better. A beautiful day, a beautiful flight, a perfect mission, a near perfect mission for Discovery. America back in space after two and a half years, two and a half years after tragedy, and uh, really I think we can say a triumphant return to space. And Discovery now coming to a halt. As NASA says, it has rolled out and stopped on the runway. Roger, we'll stop Discovery. Welcome back. A great ending to the new beginning. Thanks a lot. 
NASA calls it a great ending to a new beginning. And as the Star Spangled Banner plays in the background, we, we wait uh, for the astronauts to come out. That'll be a while. Yes, it could take a uh, half hour to an hour. Discovery, to... good boy, this is Discovery. How do you read? Waiting for the status report. Thank you very much, and I read you loud and clear. Everything A-OK -okay for Discovery. Discovery, Houston, one Delta. Roger. We'd like the secondary controller to off, please. Now beginning the process of shutting down the order. Secondary controller off. Coming off. Right now we're waiting for the convoy of 30 uh, trucks to head out to uh, Discovery. Rescue vehicles, emergency vehicles. The first people out there will be a safety assessment team. And they'll be going out with toxic gas detectors. They'll be taking about 10 minutes with these detectors to move all around the orbiter, make sure that no leaks have developed. doors are coming open. They're opening the doors, but it will be at least a half hour before the astronauts come out uh, to be greeted by Vice President Bush. Bill? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it could take as long as an hour because of some of the new decontamination procedures. Anyway, uh, when the astronauts come down the stairs, as you said, uh, the vice president will be on hand to greet them. Uh, Bush's presence here, I might say, has caused a little anxiety among those who planned this landing. Uh, with the challenge in the back of their minds, officials say it was just one more logistic problem they really didn't want to deal with right now. But they have, and obviously it has had uh, no effect uh, whatsoever. Uh, looking back on the mission just a little bit, this was a very very modest, modest one, uh, a textbook mission all the way, and the blast-off went without a hitch. Now you saw the landing go without a hitch. Uh, the deployment of the $100 million communications satellite did very, very well, too. Uh, beyond that, the astronauts uh, attended some experiments, and then, as we just heard, uh, brought uh, Discovery uh, safely back to Earth. So, in this mission, the first since Challenger has been a success. It does take a lot of the pressure off of NASA, but uh, the feeling uh, among many in the space agency is that it will take perhaps a year of successful launches to really uh, restore NASA's credibility and confidence. Uh, before we leave you, I'd like to uh, remind you that uh, we are still following this uh, story, uh, that the U.S. has been told that uh, an American hostage in Lebanon will be freed. Uh, again, we have very few details as to when or under what circumstances this uh, might happen, but please stay tuned throughout the day. Uh, uh, we'll be providing uh, complete coverage. The landing of the shuttle Discovery, a special report. I'm Bill Grudy, along with Bruce Hagen at Edwards Air Force Base in California. CBS News, I'm Christopher Glenn at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And I'm Rob Armstrong in New York. There are two major stories today. The shuttle is back and an American hostage is reportedly about to be released from captivity in Lebanon. First, the shuttle story. Shuttle discovery, gleaming white in the desert sunshine, has ended its historic flight the way it began. Textbook perfect. Playing peekaboo through a gauzy veil of high clouds, the spaceship swooped down to a dusty landing on the dry lake bed runway. Commander Rick Houck at the controls. Trail stop. Roger, we'll stop discovery. Welcome back. A great ending to the new beginning. Nearly 400,000 people Thanks came to see the landing, an unprecedented number, cheering themselves hoarse from their first glimpse of the orbiter high above. In less than an hour, Vice President Bush will be out on the landing strip to greet the crew as they emerge from the spacecraft. They left behind in space a $100 million communication satellite, its deployment the principal goal of the flight. Now, that may be, but it wasn't nearly all of it. For all of us, Discovery's triumph goes a long way toward healing the hurt of the Challenger disaster two and a half years ago and pointing the way, as NASA put it, toward the nation's new beginning in space. And now the latest developments in the hostage story. Here's Rob Armstrong in New York. CBS News, this is Judy Muller. Word today that an American hostage soon may be released. Among those saying so, the Syrian foreign minister. He'll be released in uh, Lebanon, uh, where he's kidnapped, and uh, the uh, Syrian security forces will bring him to Damascus in order to hand him over to the American ambassador in Damascus. The Syrian official, Farouk al shara did not know the hostage's name, but did say he might be released, quote, any minute. Other reports from Syria say the hostage has already been released. In Beirut, the voice of Lebanon Radio identifies the hostage as American Alan Steen. 
Discovery glided home to Earth today for a picture-perfect landing at Edwards Air Force Base in the California desert. Christopher Glenn is there. The shuttle is home, the astronauts are safe, and there are nothing but grins in NASA land, icing on the cake of a textbook mission for the crew members as they emerged from the spacecraft about an hour after it had come to a stop following a dusty roll down the dry lake bed runway. The uh, access stairs are up against the side of the orbiter. And the crew of Discovery now coming down the steps, waving a large American flag. Vice President Bush, NASA Administrator James Fletcher, and Shuttle Program Chief Richard Truly were waiting to greet the crew as they wobbled tentatively down the steps after four days in weightlessness. Bush will pay tribute to them and Discovery's voyage at traditional welcome home ceremonies about three hours from now. Christopher Glenn, CBS News at Edwards Air Force Base. CBS News, this is Judy Muller. My overall view of this mission is that it's an absolute stunning success. Admiral Richard Truly, head of NASA's shuttle program, praising the performance of Discovery and its crew from start to finish, a finish that came just hours ago at Edwards Air Force Base in California. We just saw a, a beautiful deorbit and ending up uh, on center line. The, the nose wheel of that vehicle is exactly on the center line of that lake bed runway. The vehicle looks good on that on the outside. We've got the Kennedy team waiting for us to get it back down there to fly again. I don't see I can get much better than that. And uh, I'm just tickled pink and my hat's off to this team of people that did it. The five-man crew was greeted at Edwards by Vice President George Bush, who took a walk around the orbiter with the astronauts to see how it had fared during the reentry into the Earth's atmosphere. This is the world tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Christopher Glenn, reporting from Edwards Air Force Base in California. I was so excited when they lifted off. I, I was crossing my fingers and my toes, and, and I was so happy that uh, it went off well, and I'm sure we're on the right track now. That's the way it began last Thursday with a whoosh of relief after Discovery blasted flawlessly away. This is the way it ended today, as the spaceship slipped down to a picture book landing. The gear down and locked, the report from Mission Control. Main gear touchdown. Commander out now, rotating the nose down, standing by for nose gear and touchdown. Nearly 400,000 people roared with delight as Discovery came home in triumph. Its mission clearly a success, both technically and as a signal for the future. Wheel stop. Roger, wheel stop, Discovery. Welcome back. A great ending to the new beginning. Thanks a lot. An hour later, the hatch was opened and Rick Houck, Dick Covey, Pinky Nelson, David Hilmers, and Mike Lounge stepped smiling into the desert sun. The uh, access stairs are up against the side of the orbiter. And the crew of Discovery now coming down the steps, waving a large American flag. Vice President Bush was waiting to embrace them. He later paid tribute at the official welcome home ceremonies. So America is back in the game 32 months after the Challenger disaster, but Discovery's crew did not forget, as they whirled around, the sacrifice that led to this bright day. Dear friends, we have resumed the journey that we promised to continue for you. Dear friends, your loss has meant that we could confidently begin anew. Dear friends, your spirit and your dream are still alive in our hearts. I'm Christopher Glenn at Edwards Air Force Base. More news with Doug Poling in New York when the world tonight returns.